Joyce and how the Singapore is going to be. So today, um, we're very, very happy to have Cindy. Yay! Um, today, we have a very small crowd, which is nice and cozy. So um, if you have any questions, please just ask. And we hope this can be an interactive thing. Do you want it to be interactive? Yes, of course. Yeah, if you want it to. Yeah. So just feel free to ask questions. Uh, you can sit around and talk to us after. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to find out more about our workshops and events, you can go to sggirls.com. Yeah. And Mike, Mike here is from engineers.sg. Yay, Mike. Record and videos on the talks and videos of... Sorry, you will record most of the talks and workshops by the Tech Community in Singapore. So if you want to check those videos out, you can go to engineers.sg. So directly to the editing. Yes. <laughs> uh, so Cindy, uh, Cindy is going to talk a lot about her own experiences um, with the maker community and not, not really just with the maker community yeah. but more like, she does so many things like DIY, buying things like that so I'm Random like things yes, and, and we call her at the time because she's going to fly off to the US soon to be oh, a PhD student So upsetting Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But before that, yeah So we are all of us Yay. Um, okay, okay. I, I have to thank thanks uh, thanks to Joyce because we spoke like a few months back and in a cafe and I decided to write something about this project that I was doing and she has managed to within a short period of time find a space at IDA Labs. So thanks also to IDA IDA Labs and Sorry, the, to sign that form. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Forms are very important. <laughs> so, uh, and so thank you for the people who come here today. Uh, really, it's a casual talk. I did not do like any formal preparation except for making pictures on slides and like printing them out. If this is considered as formal. So the three themes I'm going to focus on are snails, uh, herbs, and ibu ibu. Ibu ibu is our mothers. So uh, ibu is one mother. Ibu ibu is many mothers. Yeah. So <laughs> just to clarify, because. Yesterday, my sister was asking me, so what is Ibu? Ibu? I said, why do you have two Ibus? Like, is that a grammatical error or something? But Ibu Ibu basically is a plural form of one mother in Bahasa Indonesia and Malay. So, yeah, um, this is basically the line outline, but you know, really, you don't really have to pay so much attention to it. It's just events that are happening within this themes itself. Um, so, before I keep talking, I have to elaborate what am I doing or who am I? So, uh, yes, I'm still a student, I'm studying, sadly. <laughs> and I'm going to do my PhD in Information Science in University of Michigan, in Ann Arbor. And focusing on spaces of science and tech. Um, well, now, in more recent trend, they are called hacker spaces or maker spaces. Um, it might change in 10 years' time, and I have to keep my PhD topic broad and encompassing. So yeah, spaces of science and tech is my specialty, but especially in, in Southeast Asia and more so in Indonesia. So you'll see a lot of examples about Indonesia soon in this whole slideshow. So herbs, um, I think I used the wrong word. It was not really herbs, it's more about plants. So only when I was reading slides, I was just like, oh, sorry, did I use herbs, but anyway, whatever. So the first thing that I did in Indonesia last year uh, was basically renting a space. So I was there actually for exchange and um, well most students will usually rent a hostel or something for a month or a few months or so. But I did the extreme and pretended that I was married to somebody and rented a place in Indonesia because the only thing that you sort of have to pretend that you're married to an Indonesian so that you can rent a place. Um, especially in places like Yogyakarta because you don't have a contract, it's all based on trust still. I didn't have a contract for the house that I rented for a year so I pretended I was married to my friend who later on became a collaborator in this project. So um, it's actually called the Sewan Food Lab. Uh, right now we rented out the space to a friend because um, I'm going to be away in the US so it's a bit difficult to coordinate a space where I'm so far away from it. And it was initially spatially based because we rented a place, we say, okay there's a garden here, there's like a field around us, like what are we going to do? We're gonna make food, okay. <laughs> so together with three other friends, uh, Lintan, Agus, who's actually Tim Bill, uh, Krishna, who actually has a permaculture farm in Jogja, we said, okay, let's, let's do this thing called Sewan Food Lab. So initially, in the beginning, it looks like that. Green, terrible color, but I was so appealed by it being a small unit in a place that I'm um, 
very, very interested in, which is called Sewon. Because the first encounter with this when I was doing my exchange and research in Indonesia, I was interested in graffiti, like I guess most of us Singaporeans are, because we don't really have graffiti here, only at some places. Um, and this particular initiative is called the Ganeng, Ganeng Street Art Project, or Ganeng Street Art Project. And they had like artists going to different places in Sewon to um, do graffiti for the so-called villagers' house. Um, I don't mean villagers or kampong in a derogatory manner. This is just how they call themselves. So I don't mean to say that, oh, they're very traditional. Well, they're quite open-minded, actually. So I was very appealed by the graffiti. I said, I have to have a house here. So me, <laughs> with a bit of my scholarship money, rented a place here. Um, and we decided, to, okay, let's just make this into a garden. And initially, I was thinking about medicinal properties uh, of, of plants, but it turned out more to be an edible garden. Um, maybe not so unique, I guess, but most of the edibles also had some kind of medicinal function anyway. So in the beginning, it all looks very you know, boring. And I really have to say that in the beginning, this space looked completely wreck. It's not anything like that. So it, was, it had like uh, sand piles in front because our landlord didn't want to shift it back. So there were like big hips of like concrete or I don't know what it was. So we had to shift everything back and make actually this. Uh, we made a pawn. Uh, more of like my friends make the pawn and I was like the manager there. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the pawn also had some uh, fish, which I don't remember what actually is called. Um, it's some kind of fish that is edible, but I really don't remember it. No, it's okay. Please, please join. But yeah, just join us. We we were like um, two minutes to it. Yeah, the space here as well. So I was elaborating on the first team, which is uh, herbs, and elaborating on the space that I rented in in Yogyakarta and what it has become to be like now. So yeah, so basically we had a pond and. Later on, we realized after a year that a lot of our fish was floating on the top, are floating on the top, fishes are floating on the top, not completely, no, they are dead, but not completely like it was because of the water quality or anything. It was not like that. So apparently there's this kind of creature, right? I don't know what kind of creature it is. I think maybe Adeline can tell us more about this creature. But basically it goes to like ponds. No, it's not frog. <laughs> And it dismembers, no, it dismembers the fish to various parts, and some of them half eaten as well. And apparently it's something that digs through the ground. I don't know if it's a mole, but this is what my friend in Indonesia lab, like sort of described this particular creature. So all the fishes are on the, were on the top and not, nothing could be at. Um, but uh, we tried fishing again and there were five fish still alive. So the last five fishes, I still remember, are still there. So yeah, we had all these kind of things on the wall. Yeah, trees, papayas, I'm so proud of them. And I'll elaborate why these papayas are so important later on um, at Sewon Food Lab. Yes, Jogjakarta in Indonesia. Jogjakarta, Central Java, yeah, where the Sultan is still is. Still is. Yeah. Oh. It was so fast. So that's the interesting thing, because we were staying around the rice field. And I thought that the rice field, okay, of course it might be fertile, but um, a lot of these pesticides and herbicides were on our place. Because sometimes the farmers, like, uh, they sort of like, forget and they just like, pour a bit. I mean, we don't get angry. Again, I have to elaborate why I also like Sewon, because this whole place is filled with rice fields. I was interested in farmers' rights as well. So, um, part of the Sewon Food Lab initiative initially was supposed to be interviewing these farmers and then like trying to record what they say, how we can help to like, you know, be some kind of activist. But also because of the problem about transnational collaboration is that I'm all the times mostly in Singapore, only a few months in Indonesia, there's not much in-depth ethnography that you can do if you're not there for a long period of time. So most of them just become our friends and they use our space as well to like harvest, like dry their rice and all that. I will show you some pictures later. These are peanuts, um, a lot of peanuts, very good. Uh, but some parts are less fertile than the rest because like some parts have the like over over flooding of like chemicals and stuff like that. So a bit about Yogyakarta. Yogyakarta is in central Java in case nobody knows in Indonesia and that's where they have the most number of universities um, and a lot of student initiatives and artists are living in Yogyakarta because it's affordable still and you will tend to see a lot of uh, more brown 
ground up grassroots initiative than you ever find in say Singapore. Okay, I confidently can say that because yeah, I really do believe that's true. Yeah. We have also fungi, not so interesting, I guess. And then, yeah, again, overview. Banana, so we had our, our neighbour just gave us this banana tree because it's quite common there that neighbours communicate with you. Then we make a logo. Our friend, who is staying at Seowon as well, make for us this logo, which I have to say a bit about is raw because he also did other things for us. Um, the thing I like about Jokjokala is that uh, there's always this sort of like dab system, like you can ask somebody to... to I, I wouldn't try to like essentialize this fact. I mean, I just feel that this is what I experienced. So n nothing about academics and not, nothing about being critical. I just feel like this is how I feel like. Somebody give me something and after a long period of time, I'll give them back something. So it's like a favor exchange, gift giving kind of thing. And then we have more plants and they kept growing more and more. Every time I go back three months later, there was just more, more and more plants. It became super hard to control. There were some bamboo things that we were doing as well. Even more, and there was a sunflower that came out of nowhere. I have no idea why it ended up there. Um, the interesting thing is because we are working with some permaculture uh, people, people working in permaculture, they always come to our place and they say that, okay, where's the laboratory? And then how, why are your plants like that? I don't think you have planted in the right season. So we had a lot of consultation with people coming over saying, I think you did this wrong, I think you did this right, uh, that sort of thing. So it was pretty interesting where we were situated at because there were a lot of artists and like, people were doing permaculture. We made our own log, <laughs> log seat. Um, so yeah, this, I mean, it's quite common to find these things in Indonesia. At least in Jogjakarta, you can just, a few streets ahead, you'll find a man like, you know, having a lot of bamboo plants and you can just stick them back. It's nothing expensive. In fact, more cheap than buying a ready-made. So yeah. So he helped you to like, clean it up? Yeah, we do it ourselves. So we just get it and then we do it ourselves. Like cleaning all that, we do. But the bamboo, yes, some of them do already like make sure that it's no longer sharp at some areas, so yeah. We also have brinjals, and yes, I say we are not a lab anymore because look at our rudimentary kitchen. It's really nothing, nothing that is quite fancy at all. Um, at the side here, you'll see something quite famous called, in Indonesia called angumera. And uh, this will come into topic later on when I talk about safe wine and alcohol making in Indonesia. I guess some of our friends from Indonesia will know that better than I do. So, yeah. So, bad harvest is like this, where you have like sudden uh, rainstorms and everything just goes down. I mean, I'm just trying to show you the overall place around our house. So, yeah. We have friends, artists coming over. Because sometimes I'm away, and then we have friends who come over for residencies, and I just allow them to stay at our place. We can track around the rice field or whatever. Um, this is my neighbour. He's my partner in crime, Neil. He stays opposite actually, together with um, another artist's father and yeah. It's amazing. He helps me with everything. Everything I do, he helps me. And yeah, this one, not this one. <laughs> this one. <laughs> yes, the little boy. I mean, he is my collaborator but you can only see the back view so it's not a very good way to introduce him. Yeah, not the best picture of him, definitely not. Uh, Neil is my neighbour and he comes over to my place often because uh, he wants to know like, oh, how do you plant this certain things and how do you plant these things and this is what we do because I go, I'm foreigner so even if I speak Bahasa in Asia, um, I learn how to speak Bahasa in Asia it's still quite obvious, I don't know why or maybe rumours spread quite fast in the certain area that I'm living in Everybody knows that I'm foreigner, so they always come to our place and see what we are doing and say, oh yeah, we are doing this, like say one food, like, oh, where's the labor laboratory, what, what kind of things are you making? So most people come over and give us seeds or like, maybe they splattered some, that's why we had like sunflowers as well. So <laughs> I have no idea. So yeah, our neighbours, this is the, they own the rice field opposite, beside us. So they often come and like, you know, dry the harvest in front of our place very often and you don't ask for permission it's, you just don't uh, it's just pri public and private is a bit more blurred I guess in, in Jogjakarta and of course the lab part comes to electronics since it was the initial part we just had a table and we were playing a lot with Seven Full Lab was playing a lot with bioelectronics I guess in some way or so and buying electronics in Indonesia is of course any geek's fantasy because it's extremely cheap and uh, maybe not as cheap as Shenzhen but cheaper in, in, in Jogjakarta. So you cannot get all parts, but 
the LED for red color LED was only like maybe 10 cents. Wow. 20, 10 cents or 20 cents, yeah. So it's very cheap. Um, so, of course, I'm very happy when I'm there. And of course, we don't use the table. So this is one of my collaborator, he's Tim Bill. Um, and <laughs> we often just do the electronics on the floor because we don't have enough money to buy like huge table and there was actually not much need anyway. Another of my collaborator, Lin Tan, obviously using a table but in a different way and making some of the uh, exhibitions when we were preparing for them. So Seon Flat does not only like host events where we invite friends to come over and say we also had some exhibitions which I will show later on. Then I said, okay, the green has to go. The green has to go. So we painted it white. And then we made our own gate. And then the neighbors stopped coming. So once we built our gate, none of the neighbors came in anymore. They saw it as an indication of us trying to keep our space private. So my, the neighbors, my two neighbors, the two young boys who were always helping me, stopped coming because they thought that we were not being welcoming anymore. So we always try to make an effort to say like, hey, you know, this is still open. And yeah. So one of the events we hosted late last year was Pasa Tongo, which means a neighbor's market. And there were a lot of neighborhood markets all around Yogyakarta. Nothing to, you would think the impression that you have of like neighbor's market or farmer's market, as say like in the popular, popular imagination of Singapore is that expensive, overpriced things, organic goods, blah, blah, blah. In Indonesia, it's different. Uh, it's very cheap still, it's quite affordable, at least in Yogyakarta. I can't say for like Surabaya or Jakarta, but in Yogyakarta it's really cheap still because we always have, they always have like Sunday markets where all their neighbours will use one of their houses to make into this like neighbourhood um, farmer's market in some ways or so. So we decided to do the same. Of course, I guess in some ways make it much more fancier. <laughs> and, uh, our neighbours took part, so my neighbour took part and we even had like a nice, yeah, we even make a spanduk uh, which is basically is a big banner. This was only, uh, if I remember not wrong, it was only $25. Yeah. And we, we hung it, we just, um, the way that neighbors are organized in Indonesia is that they are called RT or RWA, RT or RW. And we have to ask, they, they have like, they take charge of a certain number of houses for RT is about, how many are there, Caitlin? Do you remember? 30? Yeah. Yeah, so I remember, yes, correct. So RT has about like 10 houses. Our way has about like maybe four to five uh, RT, which means 50 houses. So we had to ask the park RT, which is taking care of all of us, whether we could have this. So we have it and. Uh, some of this is um, he was is actually a professor from the Arts Institute, and he also set up some tables and sold some things. Our neighbor got into the thing as well. And this is one of our friends who actually ferments his own wine in Indonesia. The thing about fermentation in Indonesia is quite um, common. I mean, it's nothing uh, very very fascinating or what. Um, in fact, I brought this, which is from Indonesia. Uh, it's called ragi. I found it okay. ragi. And uh, people who used to stay in Singapore for a certain period of time will probably remember this before they decided to not have it anymore. It's actually, you can use this yeast to put into rice and it later on converts it to ethanol. And you can have about a percentage of like say 3 to 4%, not very high. And this person did something different. So he. He did it with fruits and he did not use that. He had his own yeast culture that he basically ferments with fruits and sells them in bottles. The safe alcohol is very important in Indonesia because they have a lot of cases of methanol poisoning. And the only way they can ensure that you are not poisoned by methanol and still want to enjoy your drinks is to basically ferment your own wine. Um, also, the rice wine is something that is a snack actually in Indonesia. So the irony of most people will always be thinking like, oh, Indonesians drink alcohol? Do they really drink alcohol? But you have to remember that Indonesia, Islam is very particular and it's not like the common stereotype would say Islam is radical or extremist or like conservative, which is completely, if 
You don't mind me saying bullshit to me. So um, one, uh, one of the example is the ragi tape and they have like sweet snacks with a bit of like alcohol. They won't call it alcohol. If you ask any of the women there, is it alcohol? They'll be like, no, no, it's not alcohol. <laughs> so like, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so our friends came over and, and we had a lot of fun. Just hanging around my house. We have a lot of burgers as well. <laughs> and, and then we had another event, Hacktura Lab. This is not by Salem Food Lab, but it's by a friend who's doing Hacktura.org. So Hacktura is a, a, well, it's an online, it's also an online platform where basically people uploaded like, how do you do DIY by yourself? So do-it-yourself biology is a very hard concept for me to explain in, uh, uh, in detail. But I would say that basically it's like having a lab outside of a lab. So having a lab in your house or having a lab in your garage and doing simple experiments, scientific experiments with low cost tools and uh, doing it by yourself with open source recipes as well. So for example, the open PCR is one example, it's this more high tech, I guess. But also fermentation is a way to look at do-it-yourself biology. So uh, Hacktura had the Hacktura lab in Yogyakarta last year where they had about like people from 42 countries uh, or 42 people from different countries, definitely from each continent. So there are people from uh, um, Europe, people from America, people from Asia, all coming together, artists, scientists, designers, researchers, enthusiasts, all coming together to work on three projects that were already happening in Indonesia. So one of which was forest, another is river, and another one is volcano. So what I did there, because we had to do workshops, that was the spirit of Hectia. I make lubricants. So sexual lubricants with some of the members from Seoul Food Lab. Um, why I do that was interesting um, because I was working, <laughs> I was working in sex workers, uh, transgender sex workers' rights in Singapore, and one of the um, accessibility problems is lubricants. So they always have to buy their own lubricants and stuff like that. I thought the same thing happened in Indonesia as well. I was wrong. So I surveyed some of the sex works areas there, and lubricant is easier to access there. It's quite okay, as in a lot of the governments are actually helping the Yogyakarta sex workers to have access to contraceptives, so it's not a problem. Uh, but the problem was in convenience stores, sometimes the contraceptives are behind the counter. And the only sexual lubricant that I can find there was a Durex one, it was like 100,000 rupiah, that's about $10. And with $10 in Singapore, in, in Indonesia, you can buy like 10 mils, which does not make any sense at all to me. So I just like, okay, why not just make your own sexual lubricant? Anyway, this is open source. You can probably find it online as well, like homemade uh, vegan or like homemade organic lubricant. And there are a lot of people who are already doing it. So when I did this, uh, it was interesting. In Hacktiria, I thought that nobody would come for my workshop. Again, the generalization that Indonesia, Indonesians are not very receptive towards uh, topics about sex or like topics about sexuality. It was completely dismantled because I had all people, different people from all different walks of life coming to my sexual, sexual lubricant workshop and learning how to make sexual lubricants, asking all different kinds of questions. Oh, so how, how long would this last? Oh, so how should I use it? Where do I put it at? Like, it was pretty much like completely baffled me because I, when I did it in Singapore, which I'll show pictures later on, I think the questions asked in Indonesia was much, were much more, if I could say, open and comfortable than say in Singapore. So yeah, we did that and the problem was that we could not find flax seeds. Flax seeds are low in sugar and very good for making natural lubricants. We replaced that with cassava and, and corn. But what we forgot was that these two things can create yeast infection because they are high in sugar. So yes, <laughs> that was a problem they thought we realized. <laughs> uh, only when I was in Singapore, my friends like, I think that you know, it might increase yeast infection. It's like, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> but I remember in Jogjakar, we did say that there were al other alternatives and that was just because it was just trying to be resourceful in Indonesia. And in Singapore, we did that as well for Squad and Grow. Uh, it was a collaboration between DIY Bio and uh, Adeline is here. She was also one of the organizers. Um, DIY Bio, uh, our collective called Chiki Clan. <laughs> and, um, Hackerspace Singapore and Edible Gardens. So we did a, pub, a series of public workshops earlier this year on fermentation, food sonification, 
what is safe food, what are other forms of food that are coming out with uh, advanced technology like Soylent. Um, and how can we make this more, how can we make um, Singaporeans, I guess, more aware about this? And I also did the lubricant, but this time with flax seeds and chai seeds. So we are very safe this time. Uh, this we did in Hackerspace Singapore. And as you know, Hackerspace Singapore has a lot of meal presents. Not that it's anything bad or good, come on, I'm not trying to be that way. Luther was very open to it. Luther is one of the co-founders. He's very open towards uh, the whole idea. And they did not, I mean, it was not anything problematic as well, except that um, it was not as interesting the questions being asked uh, in Singapore than elsewhere. So our friends are here. We're doing the lubricant workshop. So the next team is uh, snails. So in snails came in Indonesia, France, Czech Republic, Singapore. I didn't have time to talk about Czech Republic. Not so interesting, I guess, anyway. Indonesia, I was interested in snail food. I was, this is literally a joke. Okay, so when I was in Indonesia again for my research and exchange, I, w I was always interested in snails. Like, I like snails a lot, and I brought some snails back to my, my hostel in Indonesia. And then one day I realized that most of my papers were being eaten, aw eaten away. Like, there were like holes everywhere and all that. And the culprit was actually the snail, because uh, in paper there's cellulose. So snails uh, consume paper just because of the plant substances inside as well. Um, and I decided that, that, okay, why not let's see what kind of... Because the poo that they were being produced when they ate my white paper were also white. So I decided that, okay, why not let snails eat colored paper and that the, <laughs> the poo <laughs> will also be colored. And um, again, my friendly neighbor helped me, my helper Neil brought back all the snails for me from his grandmother's place and uh, I did this project again for Hacteria and we had these sculptures, you know, making snail eat snail poo. <laughs> yes, so this is their poo, where it's colored. Yes, I mean, but, but I realized I was not the only one. Halfway doing this snail poo project, I realized a Dutch designer has already done it. She's much more elaborate than I have ever. She did this. She did house made out of snail poo. So this is quite interesting. I mean, her name, you can check it on Dizen Magazine, but her name is L-I-E-S-K. Uh, -E -E. I haven't spoke to her yet because I stopped doing the project mainly because I felt to some degree I couldn't really confirm whether my snail's health were being um, affected by consuming paper, colored paper, who, which is manufactured with chemicals. So I stopped doing that. But I guess the next step that I did with the snails was also not very ethical, I don't know. Um, I was interested in invasive alien species because of my stay in, uh, in Sewon Food Lab in Yogyakarta. So invasive alien species are like species, if I can just uh, define it simply, uh, species that do not, they are not native to a certain habitat. Invasive because they overwhelm or they overcrowd the native population and basically take over their, their presence in the habitat. And I was interested in invasive alien species because I feel like this cause surrounding invasive alien species always sort of remind me of xenophobic inclinations that certain people have or the governance have. So like the idea of um, alien, uh, foreign, was also still used for non-humans as well as humans. So if you read any like scientific discourse or even like uh, say MPAX will probably have the same discourse surrounding around invasive alien species. We have to make sure that our native populations are protected. We have to make sure that, uh, that the invasive alien species will not uh, overwhelm the native uh, species. So that kind of uh, thinking about invasive alien species kind of is aligned towards my interest for say migrant identities or like people who stay here and who are always framed as the non-native as versus to us perhaps native people of Singapore. And I did this exhibition together with Say One Food Lab at uh, CCA, at Gimman Barracks, and it was actually under post pop up. And um, again, it's raw helpers. So I interviewed a lot of farmers as well as entrepreneurs working with um, uh, plants in Singapore to find out what they think about invasive alien species, whether consuming invasive alien species was a way to manage invasive alien species. Um, also, like, uh, how do they? How do they uh, think about foreign plants in their, yeah, perhaps their farms or like, one of the people I interviewed was Bollywood veggies. So, but this was by a man who was, I think it was a man, yeah, it was a man who was actually uh, di guiding the educational tools at Bollywood veggies. And he said this literally, like, plants can escape, we've got to keep a close watch on it. And it really reminds me of like, how, how we think about human beings as well, like prisoners 
or like exiles or like migrants who are trying to cross uh, illegal border, borders. So throughout the whole exhibition, I was trying to hint at that. Some people got it, some people don't. I try not to make it explicit because um, it was more subtle than, than purposeful. So we made a synthesizer, uh, and I'll elaborate what was this synthesizer used for later. We also had some uh, non-native plants in, in the exhibition. So the synthesizer was used to make this contraption. Uh, <laughs> so we had again the African, uh, African land snail. The African land snail is not native to most places in a Asia. It's quite invasive. Um, and how the circuit works is that when the slime of the snail passes through the circuit with the copper tip here, it closes the circuit and the sound is produced. So if you know the circuit has to have a lot of electricity flowing, so if you have an open circuit, that means that you have to have something conductive that connects the circuit. So slime of the snail is used because it's moist and it's a good conductive material. So I decided, hey, I really want to make snails talk. I want to make invasive alien species talk. So how can they talk? And I was like, okay, why not do this? And then maybe like, you know, they will talk or something like that, or you can make them play music or something like that. So like a snail disco. Uh, but what happened later on was that a lot of, it did not really work out as I wanted it to be planned again. Um, basically, it was, because we really make the synthesizer connect to ground. Okay, speaking in technical terms now. Um, so that not enough electricity will pass through the circuit for example when the snail passes by so they will not be electrocuted. But one thing we forgot about snails and copper is that copper is actually a pest management device, pest management material. It's not scientifically proven, I have to say. So, um, and none of the snails wanted to pass by it after that. So, <laughs> Uh, they just stayed in between and yeah, a lot of people who came there like, oh, what are you doing to the snails when, and I always say like, you know, this is funny because, well, it did not really work out as the way that we planned it, but still people were paying more attention to snails than, than ever was, because usually you just step on them and, oh, it's so bad, and then walk away. So it was still good that it was effective in some way. Uh, we also fermented some wine. So I forgot to say that one of my friends in Indonesia uh, make his own when you do fermentation, you have to allow uh, carbon dioxide to be produced. So he made this, he custom made this uh, device. So it's basically so that air will not come in, but air can escape. So it's especially important for fermentation. Uh, you can custom make it in Indonesia, but buying it, I'm not so sure. I mean, this is it's a normal laboratory equipment. You can. I don't know where to buy it, so. Uh, he custom made it because it was for exhibition that he did later on. He did in Germany. And of course, it's more effective than using straws. Because you usually use straws to allow some CO2 to escape. But with this, um, it definitely prevents the air from going in and spoiling the fermented wine. So, yeah. So, this was. Yeah, basically. And then the snails just don't. No, it wasn't working. So we had some workshops as well on why again, uh, why making, what are native plants, what are non-native plants in Singapore, blah, blah, blah. And we also, later on, we tried again at Neon Polytechnic, we also had an exhibition, Say One Food Lab. And I said like, okay, this time, the snails are not going to be tortured. I'm very, very persistent on this. Um, and I don't think they were this time. Um, in fact, we decided to do something much more simpler, which is using contact mic. Because I again want to hear the snails and allow the non-human to speak and have this uh, contact mic underneath uh, leaves so that when the snails was, were biting on it, they, there was sound that were being produced. So this is it. And it was just an amplification of their eating habits. Um, nothing much. But it wasn't really to the aesthetic quality that I wanted. It was not a nice sound anyway, so it was just interesting. And uh, last two sections of my, of my presentation, actually, urban explorations was what I did this year in Paris by myself, not with Say One Foot Lab. And um, I was again interested in snails, of course, the whole team's about snails. And in France, of course, and you would think that snails are very common there, and <laughs> it's not. It's really, it's not, okay? It's not at all. Uh, so urban explorations were started up by Media Lab and LaSalle. And uh, they started in 2012 in Singapore. So the main purpose of urban explorations was for different people from different disciplines to come together and conceptualize and make a tool to collect data from the environment. So it could be collecting a tool to collect smells, 
uh, making a tool to collect the pH of soil, uh, making a tool to collect sounds or record sounds from urban landscapes. And since I was interested in snail, uh, uh, this micro snails are so difficult to find in France, trust me. I, I took like five hours to find these snails. And these are micro snails. So three snails that are focused on in, in France it's the Helix Pomatia, which is the famous escargot, uh, the Roman snail. The Helix Expersum was also, eat, was, also, was also eaten by French people, but um, lesser than the Roman snail. And the Helix Leucorium. So these are the three Helixes that I focus on. So some of the snails. So, so adorable. They are not the African <laughs> land snails though. Um, interestingly, um, in, 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 in Paris, it's also shaped like the snail. So in Paris, how they are being urbanized is that they, this are called adornment. So they go, uh, they, well, they sort of appropriate territories around, surrounding Paris, and, uh, well, call it Paris. So there's going to be a 21 soon in Montreuil, which is also where I collected and find some snails. And it's interesting because I picked certain locations because I wanted to find out if, my basic research for urban exploration is trying to find out if Snails could act as a bioindicator for uh, the health of certain habitats in urban Paris, mainly because Paris is urbanizing so much. Yes, they are famous for gardens, but I would say that most of the gardens in the expensive areas, like one, two, six, seven, you cannot find any snails. Um, only outside of Paris you find a lot of snails, or in the outskirts where there are two forests called Belong and Vincent, so you cannot find any snails at all. So one or two that I made was uh, trying to find the pH of the soy that snails were found at. So an easy way to do that is using red cabbage, boil it, and then making it pH paper on either like uh, non-acidic paper or co coffee filters. And I make a tool, which is a stencil, like that. And when snails glide across, if, it's, if it turns blue, like that, it's alkaline. And that means that the soy is healthy, and that means it's healthy also for the snails. Um, when soil is too acidic, uh, snails will not survive there. So you can basically tell how acidic or alkaline the soil is and also like whether the snail is healthy in the area or what. Um, why I say that snails are not easy to find in France is because there was an official record of like, there being over hunting. I have no idea whether this is true or not. Um, but also a lot of French people do not eat snails anymore. Um, it's a common stereotype, it's a tourist stereotype. And only in the outskirts, say in south, southern France, you'll find like people still eat snails, but it's not common at all. And they usually import their snails from um, Poland and Czech Republic because it's cheaper. So this definitely makes the research more interesting because where can you find these snails anymore? So I make the web, the, mi the stage of the microscope is actually made by Life Patch. I'll elaborate again what Life Patch does later on, which is my collaborator in Indonesia. I just use their stage and you can dismantle a PS2 web a PS2 webcam to make a microscope. This is my toolkit that I brought around with me to different fields to collect some snails on my trolley, doing stupid things in the middle of forest. What I didn't realize, this is an interesting episode. In Boulogne, which is a, an outskirt of uh, Paris, and it's an, a park, it's not a natural reserve actually, it's a park. And, and um, I went there to collect some snails. This area is known for its red light area. So I did not know, I forgot. I really forgot. And my friend Isabel from here told me like, hey, you have to go to Boulogne because that's where you can find a lot of snails. I'm like, okay, why not? I brought my Arduino to collect some uh, temperature data and all that. I brought my computer because I wanted to use the microscope, the webcam USB microscope with the computer. But what I didn't realize is that the red light area and I always see this man around us like, <laughs> you know, just staring at us like, why is this person doing? Like, why is she waiting for me? And it's like both of my friends dragging this kind of trolley. It just looked very, very, very strange. And like taking out our samples and like putting it into Ziploc. And it's like, what's happening right here? And when I finished collecting, I finally found the snails after five hours of searching for them. That's when I realized I was in the red light area. And, and also at that moment, I was like rushing and rushing. I was like, oh my God, we have to go because suddenly a lot of the men were calling us. I was like, hey, hey, what are you doing? And then the woman was like, I think women were like, oh, who are these people? Because like, they look new, because they probably have their own territories and they've been working there for a long time. So 
we saw like strange things happening and then I remember that I got a shock when I saw like so many condom wrappers on the floor. I was like, what the fuck? Everything was like, I ran crazy. So it was just a strange experience. So like we, we brought all these bulky things and all that. And we definitely learned from the first field trip not to bring so many things at all anymore. So the snail again. This is at Vincent's. So I did an infographic uh, collecting these, the width and height of snails as well as the pH, temperature, uh, the elevation and some simple conclusions that I can make. I, I would say that this is not a proper or valid scientific experiment because I don't have any control tests. I did not keep my... Uh, basically, it's not. It was just me trying to fiddle around with data and like collecting things about uh, where the snails live in. And I found that a lot of the young snails, the baby snails, were living in very unusual environments. Firstly, they were living on like tawny, tawny plant leaves. And I always thought that tawny things always keep snails away because if they happen to glide across, it's going to be very painful. And also that's one of the pest management devices. And also found them in very hot areas. So this was definitely interesting for me because I thought like, okay, why will you find snails in very hot areas, especially for the helix because they need like colder environments. And I decided there was a certain feature that I was focused more on. Also, another strange thing was I found strange snails like that only with an eye. And this is a very unusual. Um, is I think it's either a mixed breed or it has some mutual, uh, genetic deficiency because it definitely is not a normal shell. The shell should be of um, this or oh, this color. Yeah, but it looked like that. So. That was the ending part, so it was interesting. I also found it in a very hot environment, so I was intrigued, like what, what kind of adaptive function or like, can, can these snails have that allow them to stay in hot environments and in tall areas? So this is what I was interested in, the ampigram. So I might sound a bit strange right now from this point onwards. I was interested in how uh, they could reduce water loss, and this particular function is actually the dried mucus. So when you have snails that rest, sometimes they create this dried mucus around their rim here and it basically prevents them from losing their moisture. And that particular feature makes me very interested in snails even more. Um, and it looks something like that. So during hibernation in summer, it's even better. It looks like that because there's calcium deposits uh, into the epigram itself. And they do this so that no water can be lost and so they can hibernate for a period of time. And I thought like, okay, what would happen if say, um, so okay, before I go on that, I also decided to make some videos of what the epigram looks like. I, I pasted the epigram, like I make the snails rest there. They make all this epigram on the microscope slides and they look like that. I was interested in the structure as well, how crystalline they were. And I say that, okay, in, Sing in Singapore or like in other place in, on Earth, what if we stop having water? Um, what we have to find a way to adapt ourselves? And I thought that one way to connect the snail even more than the previous contraptions of like putting them with synthesizers or like putting them in torturous environment, like m making them eat colored paper, a more subtle way is to think about adaptation and human beings. So I did some kind of speculative like <laughs> design fiction, I guess. So I 3D printed this thing, so like human epigram and make my friend model it. So I was thinking, creating this post-apocalyptic situation where, okay, human beings have no longer have water anymore, but we have our own epigram as well. So I designed a few things like that. And the overall output was basically this laboratory setting light uh, exhibition with other friends as well. So all our things were being shown there in Paris. Uh, oops. And yeah, it was kind of interesting because in France, I guess, uh, especially this was in a fine arts place, so it was not so common for them to have like such a setting for an art exhibition. So yeah, they were pretty much intrigued by what we were doing. This is one of my friends who 3D printed all these parts and he was recording all the soundscapes, urban landscapes of uh, Paris. And then using them, and you can't really see here, but using the data from the sound of different parts of Paris, making them into um, balls, so like shapes where it's like spiky, there are projections where sound is extremely loud and intense at the area. So I'm, I'm watching, I can't show it here, but it was by a very famous artist um, in Singapore, it's called Ong Kiam Pain, and I'm sorry, I cannot show here. There's mosses as well, some of them were interested in mosses, and making like handy, um, this guy here, Dia, 
he made um, it's going to be shown here anyway this exhibition in National Design Center this October so you can probably see it again he made his own lens so lens that you'll find in microscope he we got a friend in well it's not a friend in Paris there was this startup that was focused on microfluidics and he gave us some of this uh, what's it BSM or PSM that is used to make microscope lens and my friend made some of this lens by himself so this is a material you cannot usually get in Singapore it's a restricted material but we got it anyway in Paris and some of our friends were more interested in pigeons and the recent one that we did uh, with Adeline as well because right now Adeline is doing something uh, but <laughs> she's trying to basically raise awareness about maybe you can tell us a bit about it the printed circuit boards oh you mean that oh so they were starting for innovative ways to raise awareness on wildlife trafficking and to reduce consumer demand and I had made um, our friends on Life Patch have a tiger PCP and it's just a simple uh, synthesizer yes. so you just hold it and make noise and you bananas and like that <laughs> um, I thought it's a really good uh, inter interdisciplinary way of doing awareness because people will come to do it and people want to learn people come to do it and people want to learn how to make music yeah. and then you use the base the PCP as your design and then you can bring wild songs or something so something fun so we wrote a proposal and Sale. Yeah, together with <laughs> with this <laughs> together with this man here, Lintan Raditya, who's a very good synthesizer maker. Anybody who wants to make a synthesizer can ask him. He will definitely customize one for you. And he can make one. It's really cute. So if you know how synthesizers look like, uh, this is the circuit board itself and you all these parts uh, well they are conductive still, but then still you can make designs around the circuit board. And I did the platostoma platostoma, which is a kind of sea snail that is currently endangered in Southeast Asia because of mining and because I'm interested in conflict materials or like uh, raw more materials that are being used for electronics and the kind of civil conflicts or civil wars that go around these materials, I decided to focus on this snail that was endangered by mining. Okay, so last section before I read those off. <laughs> um, this is the project that I did and I guess this is the one that I wrote as well for Geek Girls. Um, it's called Nenek Project and because my area of research is about hacking and making in Southeast Asia and I was interested to um, explain why hacking and making in Southeast Asia is different from say perhaps America and I focus not on um, I focus on the Pacific demographic not only women but elderly women so what did elderly women between uh, the ages uh, who were born between 1934 to 1954 in Indonesia did think and perceive science and technology as. So Stephanie was just who's also an artist geek and researcher from Austria. Life Patch, which is a Indonesian citizen lab that does a lot of this uh, DIY bio, biohacking, also like teaching people how to make save wine or teaching people how to make synthesizers, also collaborated with us on this Nanak project. Nanak is grandmother by the way. Um, what is interesting is that this Nanak that we interview are the mothers of the Life Patch members. So if you, under, if you know who Life Patch is, there are a bunch of eight boys and one girl. So <laughs> the eight boys definitely have their own ways of doing science and technology. So it was kind of, they were a bit intimidated. It was like, Cindy, are you really sure you want to interview our moms? Like we feel a bit like, you know, awkward and all that. Like, but it was interesting because they did not ever knew that their moms also perhaps did science and technology. So they had to follow us to all these interviews with their mothers, asking them what they think about hacking, what hacking is, explaining what they were doing. So some of these mothers that we interviewed were singers, some were religious teachers, some were workshop givers, and some were even computer science lecturers. So he, I will not explain the context, it's fine. Um, so I'll just introduce the mothers. Uh, this is Sumini Suprapto. Uh, I won't say whose mom this are because it might be sensitive for them. So I'll just say this is Sumini Suprapto. She's a Kronchong singer. If you know Kronchong, it's a popular genre in Indonesia. And it sounds... It's, it sounds, the voice always sounds a bit haunting and it's actually quite a, a genre that mm, is still quite popular among Indonesians but not so much I guess among the youth so it's a bit like perhaps I would say Wayang here except more popish um, this is Amri, Amrita Ariyati and she is she's a religious teacher but she does uh, do this amazing thing so I guess we'll call her maybe the the biohacker now <laughs> which is but she's actually somebody who makes a lot of cakes 
Uh, so basically, she has an emphasis on not using processed materials. So none of the cakes that she made has to be from processed ingredients. She sorts out every single one of these ingredients by herself. And she's very fixated on the idea that a lot of youth these days are eating a lot of processed foods and like we should learn how to eat in a proper way and we should make things in a low-cost manner. So it's interesting that in our context, we'll probably call her like, oh, maybe she's like some kind of organic enthusiast or like somebody who should belong to a farmer's market. But for her, it's like a normal daily lifestyle. So that was interesting for me because I'm coming from, say, in Singapore, where we're trying to find raw ingredients to make certain things. Uh, it's very difficult. You won't find a chick chicken around that you can just take eggs from. It's just not so possible. Uh, I guess I should call Prof Wayuni. So, uh, Ibu Wayuni is uh, she's a computer science lecturer, and one of the most significant things that she said to me before, or all of us, was that she said this uh, for people who know programming, it might be an insult for you. So, sh so she said this in precise ways: that coding is for undergraduates. It's for, it's for you know. You know, people who don't know their things. And then systems is the way. So I just, to, to, for us, it's just like, whoa, this woman is already thinking about meta, meta data already. So we were just like, okay, this is an insult for those people who are doing coding and don't really know coding at first. So it's interesting that a woman at her age is still, you know, they do science and technology and she was the only engineer in, uh, in, when she was in her younger years. And one thing she said to me that really struck me was that, you know, it's not about me being a woman. It's just me wanting to do science and tech. It's really not so much about me being a woman and being discriminated. So that's one thing that we have to understand about gender in Indonesia. Again, Rani, Ibu Rani, uh, she's, she has three smartphones. So more smartphones than I can ever have. And she used them for different things. One of them is to check her, 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 her son's Facebook. The other was to take pictures and stuff like that. So, Technological production is so, so one thing about technology, but technological consumption in Southeast Asia is interesting for me. Say, for example, the amount of apps that Indonesians use is, is crazy and mind blowing. So, that's one thing that we're also interested in the net project. Uh, Ibu Shamsuri, she was, I think, our oldest interviewee. And I mean, she's from a certain era where it was difficult for her to pursue what she wanted to do in uh, her earlier years. And so, she became a religious teacher. Um, but actually what she was really interested in was fashion design. So uh, she also told us like, she was more conscious about technological consumption, like Facebook usage among younger people. So she was giving a pers pers perspective like, you know, these kind of things are like, not so good for like Islamic teachings and all that. So we had like varied perceptions of what Islam is among all these women as well. Uh, Ibu Teresa, Teresa uh, she uses recycled wood to do slow cooking in Sumatra. She's, she's from Sumatra, so in Sumatra's uh, culture, or at least Batak culture, one important thing is slow cooking. So basically, you know, slow cooking for a whole day, like curries and stuff like. That. Maybe Chinese people as well do the same thing. And Ibu Rukiati, uh, she's actually seventy-one years old now. You can't really see it from here. And <laughs> she says that, you know. And she actually used life hack. I don't know why she I probably got it from Facebook or something like that. Uh, she's like, you know, the way for me to do hacking is like being productive in life. So she has, she, she used to be, uh, she's an engineer by the way. She's a marine engineer. I won't say whose mom is this is, uh, maybe later on. And she, her son was doing a lot of river project in Yogyakarta. And he never con consulted her at all because he never asked her mom, hey mom, what kind of science and tech are you doing? So it was uh, interesting when, he find, when we finally interviewed her and the, mom was, the son was like, okay, I think mom, I have to consult you now on what I'm supposed to do for my river project. So like, that was interesting for us as well. And she keeps this Excel sheet. I don't have a picture here, but it's like humongous where she keeps the accounts, profits. Um, so she owns like a small mama shop in the front of her house. And she keeps this crazy accounts list of like whatever things are being like um, sold and uh, what is popular in demand and all that kind of things. And she still holds a job uh, in the civil, civil service sometimes. So that was interesting. So these are different phases of the research, buying in, analysis, examination, prototyping and documentation. And finally, the exhibition. So I'll briefly go through this so that we can start to discuss soon. Or if you don't want to discuss and just want to relax, this is so fine. So we had an exhibition in the end to display the kind of uh, things that we did during this NNAC project. And there was this chongkat as well that we made a kinetic uh, thing. So basically, when the chongkat is a traditional Indonesian game for the people in Singapore, so we play it. And basically, we had the chongkat shape that 
the bigger holes were where the mothers were from. And the chongkat is definitely totally different from what it looked look, look like here. So we were using the balls so that people could uh, play with the uh, chongkat itself and try to understand where this mother is coming from. Um, and the, the, because it's interesting, the chongkat has like ibu holes and anak holes. Ibu is ma mother holes, anak is children holes. So we're trying to make this analogy between the Nanak project and the kinetic installation. We also had a documentary. Um, too bad I can't show it here. But more interestingly, I think this is one of the things I worked on, which was collecting words that mean hacking and making in Indonesia. Because one thing I'm critical about is the idea of hacking and making has become somewhat of like a popular discourse. Maybe in, in, in Singapore it's okay because we use English, but elsewhere in Indonesia or Thailand, there are ways of making and hacking that already exist in their own language. So I was interested in that and I took the interviews as well as some literature, as well as from Life Patch members, what does hacking and making mean? So Ota Atik is tinkering in Indonesia and they also have a thing called uh, Oprek, which is basically a hack. Um, and yeah, so we created all this glossary of terms and of course most, most of the Indonesians there who, who already knew perhaps about hacking or maker culture is interested to also know that they already have one in Indonesia. So yeah. We also make an application where we uploaded the, the hacks that the mothers have, so like how to make kue kue from ingredients. So the application is actually online, you can check it here. And this is the end of my long talk. So for more information, you can like just go to all these websites. This is my email, my website and all the other things, like my friends' names and all that. So thank you for staying on the wall. Thank you so much. I'm really tired. Any questions? Any questions that you guys want to ask? Like, how do you start okay. a food lab in Singapore? Oh, I don't know. Probably every is exhausted, don't worry. Just send an email if you want to. <laughs> or just look at the websites. Look at Life Patch website. Or maybe for the Nanak project as well. Because we recently had our exhibition in Basel as well. So, Basel the people in Basel were having a different perspective of what it's hacking and making in Indonesia. So, yeah, you can probably just check out the links yourself. Otherwise, yeah, please just relax and if you want to go home, just go home. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for coming okay, all the way okay. here. One question. question. Yes, Saad. <laughs> yeah. How do they breathe? How do they breathe? How do they breathe? Hey, that's an interesting question. I never thought about it before. <laughs> I think they have some, uh, their skin has some skin, uh, I remember some feature that allows, their skin is the one that has certain enterings or like holes or something that allow them to breathe. I've never thought about that before. That's the next feature that I might focus on. What, uh, my, my question, what do you do to the snails that you collected, like in Paris? Release them back in the same place. Because that's the only way that you can do science ethically, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yes, he's my assistant in many, many projects. Um, he's my assistant for building the house. He's my assistant that comes for our market. Any events, he's always there. I mean, in Indonesia, starting a collaboration there really much depends on trust. And if you have a space like that, your neighbours are the most important. So as a foreigner, I felt a lot of the process or time that was being spent to make this lab was buying in the trust from my neighbors themselves. So yeah. Oh, crunchy! It's crunching noise. Cause if you feed them like harder leaves and vegetables, uh, it's like yeah. You can try at home. You can just put a snail inside a bottle and then have some uh, cabbage, and you can just put it here and you can hear them. It's very loud. The, the circuit for the yeah. conductive thing. I tried to in Yogyakarta again. It did not work well. The snails just... No, it's just not working. I couldn't find a conductive material that was not metal. All metals repel carbon, snails. Carbon, yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Carbon. The carbon, yeah. I tried to like rub pencils on the masking tape. Then work. The conductivity was not high enough. And if you increase the voltage, yeah. your snails will electrocuted and die. So... That, that, con that particular thing is something that I hope to work on, but it's, it's too time-consuming, I, I guess. Okay, no so.
Not so, I guess. I don't know. No. Yes, you should. Actually, nobody has started it yet here, interestingly. Actually, that, that Dutch designer is definitely somebody too. She not even make the tiles, she make like other things as well. I don't know what other things that she made. So the snail pool is interesting, but you have to uh, be careful because some paper they don't really eat. I think because of the lack of cellulose in the paper itself. So yeah. Can you use the paper? It works. Yes, you can. Yes. Yes, it will be the best thing for because, well, I mean, some people, some snail activists from I don't know where will probably start asking you like, oh, are you sure that the food coloring won't harm the snails? But I would think that that's a safer choice than feeding them colored paper. So yeah, coffee filter, because it's not acidic as well. So yeah. Mm. I was wondering whether the No, not at all. Sorry? Uh, yes, fresh, but it dries later on. So it makes a terrific material for, for making hard concrete materials. Actually, one thing that most people can try is also like drying out your bread, and then you can make furniture out of it. So one of our friends from Seiwan Fu Lao, so he wanted to do something like that, because he bakes a lot. The bread, you leave it out, it becomes very hard, like baguette. Baguette is one thing. And you can make like furniture, like a chair out of it. And there are a few artists that did that as well, I think, before. So yeah. So if there are no more questions, <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. <gasps> yes. Um, it's now no. I I cannot rent the space anymore because I felt like I wasn't there. So like my friends were also very busy with their own things. So we no longer have a space, but the collective still exists. Except in non spatial non spatially. Yeah, there's no space anymore. The place now is rented to our friend. Yeah. Sadly. Uh, the still there. Everything is still there. The papaya, the peanuts, the yam, the potato, everything is there. Yeah. Anyway, if you want to know the the place I rented, um and because I'm foreigner, it was one and a half years for nine hundred dollars sing. Yeah. Wow. $900 thing. It could go cheaper, but I think one important thing to realize is that when you do this kind of initiatives, you have to realize that you might also accidentally gentrify the area itself. So that's one thing that's happening a lot in, in Indonesia, gentrification. Because, um, well, if you have some kind of like cultural activity that's happening in a certain area, naturally, some other things will happen and the whole place might suddenly become the next uh, sexy startup valley and <laughs> the whole place will become expensive and it's not good for the farmers who are staying there so um, I think maybe it's time for us to not stay there as well I don't know but anyway there's another initiative that I hope to start soon in Indonesia and Adeline unfortunately has just left um, but we plan to make a lab in uh, this place called Wonosari which is in the outskirts of uh, Indonesia and it's rumoured that that piece of land is still a primary rainforest and because Adeline's a scientist She's interested in um, taxonomizing and also trying to collect oral histories of villagers who are staying around there to see what kind of medicinal properties certain plants have. It has not been archived. So yeah, that's one of the what, things that we plan to. Unfortunately, no snails at the moment because I'm a bit like trying to keep some distance from them. <laughs> so yeah. Yes. Yeah. So did you find that that it was also the same in Indonesia and they hence become hesitant about adopting these do your own sexual movement for example. In in Singapore, you no, mean the sexual in Indonesia. Yeah. Was that similar? No, it's it's quite common in for example in Jogjaka for people to make their own things. Like tinkering. Okay, I only can say this for like the people I know. Tinkering for them is like a common thing. They have like tire repairmen everywhere, and it's not like something in like an anomaly. But if you're talking about software-based hacking or like some kind of more highly advanced technology like data mining and stuff like that, not so common in Indonesia. But more hardware-based uh, woodworking, uh, yes, completely common in, in in Indonesia. I would say so. A lot of people there are very good with um, hardware-based things so yeah biology mm, not so but if you want to ask them about plants they definitely know more than I think Singaporeans do 
So yeah. <laughs> okay. Do you, so wait, last, last yes. Yes. <laughs> Oh, yes. Uh, so DIY Bio is a collective that we have in Singapore as well. Uh, a few of our friends, I would say Alexa is sometimes there, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, DIY Bio recently, uh, well, some of the members, even though I'm leaving to Michigan soon, but then other members are active, like using the, the open PCR machine to do like uh, experiments outside of labs, say finding out the gene, gene barcoding or finding out the genes of certain uh, food to know whether like sushi is really sushi like tuna is really tuna or something like that also fermenting wine and stuff like that so I did not put DIY Bio here I'm so sorry but you can just check DIY Bio Singapore and you can find it on Facebook DIY Bio spacing SG yeah. so yeah. Thank you. yeah thanks for coming thank you so much yes so I should stop this